Okay, so in this video we want to look at calculating um, measures of spread for a continuous random variable. Um, so we've looked at measures of center, we've looked at measures of center and spread for discrete random variables. So there really isn't much new here. Um, we're looking here at variance and standard deviation. We'll talk about a couple of other measures of spread, but we won't um, really use those that frequently. So variance, as we know, is the um, average of the squared distances from the mean. Um, technically speaking, that's what's happening. However, we tend to use this, uh, so we could calculate it for a continuous random variable by integrating over the domain x minus the mean all squared times f of x. Um, but actually, remember, we have our computational formula, which we derived back in the, um, when we looked at measures of spread for discrete random variables. Um, Derivation of this formula in the context of a continuous probability distribution can be seen in your textbook, um, but it is, we did the derivation ourselves um, when we looked at discrete random variables, so um, there's nothing new here. Standard deviation is the square root of the variance. Um, notation is all the same here, and we record this property of standard deviation um, that for a roughly symmetric distribution, approximately uh, 95% of the distribution will lie within two standard deviations of the mean. Two other measures of spread that we can talk about are the range and the interquartile range. So range being the largest value minus the smallest value and interquartile range being um, Q3, the 75th percentile, minus Q1, the 25th percentile. Um, so we've looked at calculating percentiles in the previous video, um, so we could calculate those and work out interquartile range. The interquartile range, of course, gives the spread of the middle 50% of the distribution. Okay, let's just look at some examples. Continuous random variable x has a probability density function given by this piecewise function. So again, it's not really a piecewise function, it's essentially just that because it's zero everywhere else. Um, so that's how you can think about it. We want to find the value of k, so if it's a probability density function, we know that the total area has to be 1. So we're going to use that fact to find k, so that we know that if we integrate over the domain, which is 1 to 9, the probability density function, it should equal 1, and we can use that to find k. So again, we can take the k out of the integral and divide it over to the other side. So we know that the integral from 1 to 9 of 1 on x dx is equal to 1 on k. Uh, antiderivative of 1 on x is log e of x. And I can just use round brackets because the numbers are all uh, bigger than 0. Okay, so we're going to have log e of 9 minus log e of 1 equals 1 on k. Remember log e of 1 is 0, so that is log e of 9 equals 1 over k. Multiplying by k and dividing by log e of 9. Okay, so we found the value of k, um, which now means essentially that our probability density function is 1 over x times log e of 9. Um, we want to find the mean and the variance of x, giving your answers correct to three decimal places. Okay, so three decimal places, so we've got our CAS, so let's define our probability density function. So menu 1, 1, let's call it f of x, so it matches what it's called on the paper, and it's just going to be 1, one over x times log e of 9, and we know that's over the domain 1 to 9, inclusive. So the mean would be the expected value of x. We know that is going to be the integral from 1 to 9 of x times f of x. And so our CAS can work that out for us. Integral from 1 to 9 of x times f of x dx is 4 on log e of 3 which to three decimal places, control enter is 3.641. And the variance of x, so before we can calculate variance, we're going to need expected value of x squared. So let's work that out as well. So same calculation, except it is x squared times f of x. Okay, so that is 20 on log e of 3 
which is approximately 18.205 and so therefore the variance of x is the expected value of x squared minus expected value of x all squared so it is 18.205 minus 3.641 squared so it is that minus that squared which is to three decimal places 4.948 so variance and expected value find the range and the interquartile range of x correct to three decimal places okay so the range is just the largest x value is 9 and the smallest x value is 1 okay so the range is just going to be 8 okay interquartile range we're going to need to calculate q1 and q3 okay so to find Q1, it's the 25th percentile, so the integral from 0, oh sorry, not 0, the lower value of our domain is 1, from 1 up to Q1 of our function has to be 0.25. Again, we're three decimal places, so I can work with decimals there rather than writing a quarter. Okay, and when I do that, it's going to give me Q1. So if I solve, shift plus, from 1 up to, let's say, Q of f of x dx has to be equal to 0.25, solving for Q. Okay, obviously you have to be between zero, uh, 1 and 9, so Q is going to be 1.732. And for Q3, it's going to be integral from 1 to Q3 of f of x is 0 0.75, so it's the 75th percentile. So I can just edit this same calculation and make it up to 0 0.75. Um, and again, it has to be between 1 and 9, so that is 5.196. And so therefore, the interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1, which is 5.196 minus 1.732. So I'm going to use as many decimal places as I can see there. I'm just going to retype it though. 19615, take away 1.73205. Okay, so to three decimal places, that is 3.464. Okay, so range is 8 and interquartile range is 3.464. So 100% of the data distribution occurs over a span of 8, whereas 50, the middle 50% is occurs over a span of only about 3.4. Okay. So it gives us a bit of a sense of, you know, how spread it. Range on its own can be hugely swayed by sort of outliers. You know, if this distribution, um, you know, this distribution is, what is it? It's a hyperbola, isn't it? So it's essentially kind of doing that. So the range might be 8, okay, but what we're seeing is the middle 50% um, happens, you know, only within a span of 3.4, okay, and there's 50% in there, or 3.5-ish. Okay. All right, um, example 2, the continuous random variable x has a probability density function given by this piecewise function. Sketch the graph. Okay, so they're both linear, um, so just think about endpoints. So when x equals 1, this will equal 0. When x equals 2, it will equal 1. So it essentially does that. Sorry. That. Okay. And then when x equals 2, it equals 1, so it goes through the same point. When x equals 3, it equals 0. So it basically does that. And then 0 everywhere else. Okay. All right, let's just neaten that up. So... So it goes to 1, 0, and 0, 1. Sorry, not 0, 1, and 2, 1. And then back down to 3, 0. Then don't forget we have this 0 otherwise. So making sure that we actually draw in the function either side as well. Okay, so that's the point 2, 1. 
find the interquartile range of x. Okay, so having sketched the function, this is where even if it doesn't ask you to sketch it, I would still always think about what it looks like because it's really nice and symmetric. Okay, so interquartile range of x, we're going to find q1 is going to be sort of somewhere here where that will be 25%. But once we've found q1, it's perfectly symmetric and so we should then be able to use symmetry to find q3 rather than... Um, you know, rather than have to find it with a separate integral or whatever. The other thing to recognise here is everything is nice straight lines. So we could also use um, triangles here rather than um, anything else. And in fact, you know, in fact, if you think about it, this this has a, this line has a gradient of one. So these triangles are nice isosceles triangles. So if you wanted, you could just think about well, half times base times height of that triangle has to equal a quarter. So x squared on 2 equals a quarter, a quarter, sorry, x squared equals 2 on 4, which is a half. So x is plus minus root half, but obviously, you know, we're talking about a distance. So it's positive root half, so it's 1 on root 2, or root 2 on 2, however you want to write it. Okay, so that's literally that distance. Okay, and so therefore we can work out that q1 is 1 plus that value, and Q3 is 3 minus that value. Okay. Q1 is 1 plus 1 on root 2. Or let's do it as root 2 on 2. Which means that's 2 plus root 2 all over 2. And Q3 is going to be 3 minus that. Oops, root 2 on 2. 3 is the same as 6 on 2. So that is 6 minus root 2 all over 2. And so therefore the interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1. Okay, careful about the fact that you're subtracting. You're subtracting all of that. So it's 6 minus 2, which is 4. It's minus root 2 minus root 2. So minus 2 root 2 over 2. And we've got a nice common factor of 2 there. So 2 minus root 2 over 1. So it's just 2 minus root 2 for the interquartile range. Okay, so do think about the geometry of it as well. Okay, they're just triangles, they're isosceles triangles. Um, I can therefore use that fact to find a length rather than thinking about an x coordinate. And actually, that makes it easier to, count, to find both q1 and q3 um, from that information as well. All right, so um, measures of spread, variance, same formula we used for discrete random variables, standard deviation, take the square root of the variance, um, and also thinking about interquartile range and quartiles. Uh, the work today is exercise 15C.